that, let's welcome Abby McCloskey, an economist and Republican political consultant who is based in Dallas. She is also an impact leader at the exchange. And Lisa Osborne Ross, U.S. Chief Executive at Edelman, based in Washington, D.C. Aijin Pu, the co-founder and executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, who is based in Chicago, will be joining us a bit further into the conversation. She is also an impact leader. Abby, Lisa, thank you so much for being with us. Happy to be here. Thanks so much. To those tuning in over the live stream, you can follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag rule with us. Okay, so let's jump in. We have a lot to cover today. But first I wanna talk about what the workplace of the future looks like and how the events of the past nearly two years, uh, COVID-19 uh, or the George Floyd protests or any of the other upheavals that we've seen over the past 18 month, months, including the presidential election, have shaped it. Lisa, let's start with you. You're a CEO, you lead a company with more than 2,500 employees. And back in September, you wrote this about the workplace of the future. First and foremost, it's a worker's workplace, run one rooted in flexibility, transparency, and accountability. What do you mean when you say it's a worker's workplace now? What I mean is um, for people like us, because I am a CEO, but I'm also a worker. I'm also an employee. And uh, I think the murder of George Floyd and the racial reckoning that followed uh, the, the trials and tribulations of COVID and everything that happened this year made all of us rethink our priorities. Um, the inequities that we many of us have known were always there, but that were exposed with these twin crises um, have said to people like me, again, as a worker and also as an employer that um, the shift has happened we once looked at work as the end all and the be all. We worked and we had to work our lives around that. But when your life and livelihood are threatened in the way that we have seen in the past 20 months with everything that's been happening in the world, it makes you rethink the amount of time and effort and energy. It's not that people don't want to work, but the way I choose to work, which is why I say it is a worker's environment, but the way I choose to work is paramount now. And because of a worker shortage and a skills, um, I worked for Bob Reich at the Labor Department. He always talked about a skills mismatch. Because of that skills mismatch, it is an opportunity. And I was happy the way you talked about it as a very positive thing. The opportunity for us to redefine work um, and to have more balance from a employer and employee perspective is what's happening. And I think it's very good for the workforce. I think it's very good for industry. And I think it's very good for, for those of us who are following and leading. Yeah. Um, Lisa, how has Edelman itself adjusted to, to this, to what you're saying? You know, we, um, my 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 colleagues, I don't use the word employees when I'm talking about the people that I work with. My colleagues are the most important thing to me. I have always had an, uh, this point of view that if you put people first, profitability follows. And then the third P that I think has been added as a result of all of the circumstances that we just talked about is purpose. And so the way Edelman has and I have to say, I'm very proud that we didn't have to go far, but the way that we have nuanced the things, the way that we have made some slight pivots in the way that we were working is very clearly people first, um, creating workplaces and work environments where people are excited about coming to work, where they believe that what they're doing um, matters and is material and makes a difference, where they are uh, compensated for it, where they are seen, where they are recognized, and where they can make an impact with our clients. Um, those three things, people first, profitability flows from that, and purpose has got to be at the basis of all of it. So. Edelman, we were leading in that space, that's sort of our DNA, but we have certainly fully leaned into it now and we're seeing very positive results as a, as a result. Are you, um, are you going to a sort of hybrid setup or a we are. flexible setup? Okay. For, yeah, for we, we, we are. And it's so funny that you're asking this, Elizabeth, because I just got finished doing sort of meetings with all of the operations. And I said to people, look, 
we're setting up a hybrid approach um, where you were asked to come into the office for you know three days a week. If that works for you, do it. If it doesn't, then don't. I don't really care where you work as long as you work with purpose, um, as long as you put people first for our managers and when that leads to profitability. I don't care when and where and how you do it. I, I For the latter part of my career, before I came to Edelman, I had two children um, who needed me more than I expected them to in college. I had my mentor, my muse, my everything, my mother uh, was transitioning. And um, I worked, did some of my best work from a hospital room. Um, I did some of my best work, you know, on my kids' campuses. And um, so it doesn't matter where you work. And I think this flexibility and understanding that is critical and COVID has forced us into this. So for me, it doesn't matter where you work as long as what you do produces positive outcomes for the people that you work with and for the clients that we serve. Yeah. You mentioned workplaces that are respectful of family. Um, and it happened in your own life. I know this is on everybody's minds because when we asked for audience questions, the most common one we got was around working moms. Um, how can companies successfully retain them? How can companies help them? So Abby, you have written extensively about the best ways to help women juggle their work and family lives. From your perspective, is the workplace finally shifting to adjust to these new family dynamics? And, and what are the most important innovations coming out of COVID? Thanks so much, Elizabeth, and so good to be with you. There have been so many shocking polls that have come out of the pandemic, but one of the numbers has stood out to me more than the others, and that's that 50% of all working parents have considered leaving their job in the last year uh, because of caregiving concerns. And we're seeing this transformational shift in how we think about work and family and that it used to be cutting edge and still is a rarity for companies to offer benefits like paid maternity leave, uh, less has access to that. It's a rare uh, child care support. But what we is this quantum leap forward in the conversation that it even goes beyond the additional benefits or perks that go to parents. It's actually about a fundamental restructuring of how, whether it's remote work, whether it's predictable schedules for people who can't work remotely to secure childcare, whether it's changing the hours work, that there is a rethinking of how to blend both work and family. And interestingly, it's happening for both men and for women men are likely to quit their job right now and to cite flexibility reasons for doing so. And so there's something in the water, for lack of a better word, there's something changing with how we think about these things. And I think historically, because it has been so hard for women of young children, I have three young children myself, so I, I feel it personally to engage in the labor force, that the increase in flexibility in particular could help women bridge these years of having young children uh, to continue on for the you know 30 or 40 years beyond that of having a robust and engaging professional life in addition to a family one. So I think it's a really exciting time. Yeah. Abby and Elizabeth, if I could add, I, I had an experience this morning where a colleague told me that in a um, uh, an onboarding session that they it was revealed that Edelman has uh, bereavement leave when you have the loss of a child, and these are things that you would have never seen. You know, Abby, you study this. These are things you would have never seen before, and so this recognition of our humanity is so incredibly important and. And this may be unpopular, what I'm about to say, and I say this as a working mother, and the needs of working mothers are so important, Abby. I was happy to hear you talk about working fathers, and but caregiving and just anyone's time is valuable. You know, whether you are a working mother or whether you are single or whether you are a single parent, um, but all of our time is valuable and, um, so having children is a very visible reason that you have to go home, but sometimes you have to go home because you have a life. And whether you're a parent or not, that should also be respected. Right. Time is this universal constraint we all bump up against. And there does seem to be too much to do between work and family to fit it into any sort of a livable schedule. Yeah. Um, sometimes lawmakers and businesses have to be reminded of 
why something that sounds good morally is also good economically. Can you, Abby, can you remind us why valuing care and family can help the economy? Sure. I mean, so many, so many ways. If we're talking about paid leave and we'll pick up with, with that, it's both beneficial from an economic standpoint, economic growth and increasing women's labor force attachment. And certainly in places um, in your periods of leave, we see more women connected to the labor force than we do here. But importantly, it's also really important for kids' outcomes and infants' outcomes. And there aren't daycare centers that take people when they're two weeks old. It's time development for the child and also in the father and as a family as a whole. This is both an economic issue, as you said, it's also a moral issue, it's also a healthcare issue. And the same type of, you know, hard to put into a box issues extend to child care, right? Which is both an issue of women's work, but it's also an issue of a child's development and how do we ensure that whether children are cared for inside the home or out of it, that they have access to high quality environments for their own growing into an adult with a professional life and for their own development and also for the parents. Uh, to be able to engage in, in the labor force. And, you know, the pandemic was a horrific and traumatic experience. And, you know, I often think of like my grandparents who had saved pieces of foil and rewashed the block bags after being through the Great Depression, habits that lingered with them. And I think despite, you know, the immediate danger of being gone, I, I think we'll probably see symbol, something similar following the COVID pandemic and how people mm -hmm. view and desire to care for their children and family and have a more flexible um life and, and i do just think that we have so many women right now we have so many people in general but so many women on the sidelines of the economy and when you when you ask stay-at-home mothers why they're not working even more than the cost of child care inflexible hours and remote work come up and those norms yeah. have changed during the pandemic which i think is a really promising uh opening for the future yeah, we're definitely going to get back to paid leave um that's a big topic and and even the great resignation right now i want to drill on drill in on this idea of flexibility so it sounds like there's a lot of positives but also potential downsides for women if companies don't implement hybrid work well um politico magazine just published an article on monday about the potential dangers to women of hybrid work and the fear is that women will take advantage of this new flexibility while men won't and workplaces will continue to favor employees that are physically present i just read recently that according to research from McKinsey and Lean In, 60% of women say they feel judged or worried when they take advantage of opportunities to work flexibly. Lisa, as a CEO, you probably think constantly about the unintended consequences of new ways of working. How can you make sure that companies actually respect hybrid work schedules rather than punish those who use them? You know, it's actually really simple for me. I need those women. It goes back to your very first question about when I say that it is a worker's environment. Um, I need those women. I need, um, their, I need them to bring their full selves to work. I need them to um, opine. I need them to care. I need them to challenge. Um, I, if I don't have that balance in the workplace, I think if we haven't learned anything over the past 18 months, 20 months, is that the importance of all types of diversity and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table. And so for me, I have to accommodate those women because I need them in order to do what I talked about earlier, um, to ensure that my clients have counsel that leads them to meet their goals, that my colleagues feel like they have a, 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 a positive purpose-filled environment to work in. So you really don't have a choice. I almost find it comical for organizations who um, are not doing everything they can to retain these women um, because you can't operate without them. And it's very clear to me. Yeah. As a, as a female CEO, it may be very clear to you. <laughs> well, and as a, as a female CEO of color too, Yeah, you know, the, 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 the goals and the needs of women of color are amplified by everything that we're talking about. Um, and then the goals and needs of women who are in, um, uh, economically disadvantaged situations um, are amplified by everything that we're talking about. So um, uh, I actually think I love the way you talked about it at first. This is exciting. I think we have a chance to reboot and recast the way that we work um, in a way that is more inclusive and more understanding and more flexible. I, 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 I welcome it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned. Um, oh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to be building on that because your piece on Monday and Politico and the potential for women to be mommy tracked into a less ultimately, you know, certainly productive career than they could have otherwise had was fascinating. And I recommend it to everyone listening to this. But I do think in general, to Lisa's point of it being exciting, that having more choices is better than having fewer. And I think women haven't had a lot of choices uh, leading up to this. Now we have a tight labor market. Remote work has been more normalized and we're starting to see a greater choice set available. And I think, you know, to me, the conversation about working parents in particular is it's, it's a relatively short season when the care is the most intensive. And so really this is not permanently mommy tracking for 40 years of a career. It's how do you bridge if people have less than two children on average, how do you bridge this really short season where demands out, outside of work are extremely high but you know, retain your attachment to the labor force. And I think thinking of it as a small period to bridge as opposed to you know, a, a completely different track is a really helpful frame to think about it. That's, that's really interesting because I, I think people often don't think enough about women who, older women, who are, are, you know, may not be taking care of young kids anymore and who want to get back into the labor force and who are ready, they have plenty of time to give and they want to take on bigger roles. Um, Lisa, you mentioned uh, uh, women of color and equity here. And I, I've been reading that black women are, are the group of workers most likely to say they want to work from home. Broadly, all women say they want to work from home, but black women especially. And there's been talk of women who think that the remote environment is better for them because they don't deal with the constant kind of microaggressions, um, you know, hostility that they found in the workplace. How do you, do you think about that when you, when you made your own company's policies? God, yeah, I think about it and, and it breaks my heart to be perfectly honest with you, but it's one of the realities the, that we have to deal with for, for me. And I say this to everyone that I have the honor and the pleasure of working with, um, bring, you and your challenges and your idiosyncrasies and your your weirdness and your beauty and your talent bring that to work every day because that's real life and the clients that we are representing are not martians uh they are real <laughs> people and so when you bring your full self to work that's how we can come up with solutions because our clients and the things that they're dealing with are full self issues and so um I, it, it worries me, it bothers me, but I think all of us have an obligation to make sure that people, regardless of their circumstances, regardless of what they look like, feel like they can be themselves in the workplace because um, you know, it's, we're gonna see how all this works out. I just had a, a young man of color tell me that uh, he so missed being in the office because he could go to his supervisor and tap her on the shoulder and say, show me how to do this. And if he saw a microaggression, he was more comfortable addressing it face to face with someone. Um, and so I think it works both ways. But um, again, I think this is exciting. I think we have an opportunity to shift. Um, and I think all of us on this call and people listening have, you know, I always say you have power, use it. And so all the things that we're talking about, we can drive these things in our individual workplaces and meet back here in a year and see what a difference we've made. What you just said about the young man coming to talk to you, it, it makes me think of this interesting generational gap that Abby, you actually pointed out to me earlier this week. So people, people watching might think that younger workers, since they're more mobile and tech savvy, would prefer remote work. But in fact, according to one survey, Gen Z and millennials are more pro office than yeah. Gen Xers and baby boomers. And Gen Z was the most the most pro office group of all um, by a, by a large margin. So, Abby, what, what why do you think that's the case? Yeah, it was an interesting poll, and I do think there are you know logical reasons for it. Um, the first being, since we're talking about caregiving, that you know that age band is probably 18 years old to 24 years old and is a time before many people are acting also as caregivers of their own children or of aging parents and so there's not those responsibilities that would really benefit from flexible work but also at the beginning of someone's career that's a time when you establish relationships and mentor relationships and relationships with your colleagues there's a lot of social capital built there and some of the critique about the extension of remote work that's happened during the pandemic you know 
continuing on is that, well, during the pandemic, a lot of these relationships were already formed. And so it was okay for them to go on ice and go remote for 18 months, things like that, because there's already so much behind them. But over the long run, it's going to be really hard to break in to an office environment and things like that if there hasn't been together time. And so that's why I'm really hopeful about the hybrid vision that's emerging and the chance to do both. That gives both time to build social capital in person, but also flexibility to be a whole person and have a whole life. And obviously that's not available in every profession, but it's more available than has been the status quo thus far. And so I'm really excited about, you know, in particular for working parents, this move to a more hybrid model. Yeah, interesting. Okay, I see that Aijen Fu is here. I'd like to welcome her in. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, great to be with you all. So up until now, we've been talking about how COVID really changed um, workforce has made them more hybrid and more flexible, but largely that's been about in office workers. You, you focus on service workers, care workers, domestic workers, nurses, and this is a group of people that undergird our economy and yet often are paid extremely low wages, have poor job stability, face unsafe working conditions and sometimes outright abuse and don't have the flexibility that a lot of white collar workers do. It's also a group that is largely women and women of color. Um, has the pandemic a moment where both the vulnerability of these workers, but also how important they are to the economy and society actually, do you think it's improved outcomes for this group? I will say that the increased awareness about just how vulnerable so much work in our economy is and how much of that vulnerable work is actually essential to our health, our safety and our well-being is definitely the biggest opening in, oper in generations, I think, to improve the quality of low wage work in our country. And we have to seize this opportunity to make these jobs better jobs. There's so many essential frontline service jobs that are disproportionately women. And for workers like domestic workers, 82% of domestic workers came into the pandemic without a single paid sick day. And it's by work, by definition work that has to be done in person. And so what we saw was literally hundreds of thousands of people lost all of their income overnight and had no security, no savings, no safety net to fall back on. And they had their own kids who were home from school um, and struggling with online learning. Then you had another set who continued to work through the pandemic as home care workers, for example, who are caring for some of the people who are most vulnerable to the COVID virus itself, like older adults, people with disabilities. And they were paying out of pocket for their own PPE. They were paying out of pocket for safer modes of transportation to and from work, all on incomes of about $10 an hour. So it's just been a really difficult time for this workforce. And I think it's really on all of us to say that cannot continue. The fact that there's so many women who are working incredibly hard doing everything right and still have to choose between gas and school supplies, food and paying the phone bill, it's just ridiculous and it can't continue, especially now that yeah. we're calling everyone essential. Mm -hmm. um, and and Elizabeth, I, I, I also think about for that cohort, they were also disproportionately impacted by COVID. So in addition yeah. to dealing with everything that um, uh, iGen was just talking about in terms of their professional life, many of those women were also going home to sick children, sick parents, sick family members, and um, serious, serious levels of mortality. And so they were getting hit on both sides. Yeah. One of the the fascinating um, things I've, 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 there's sort of two narratives within the great resignation, right? So we're all seeing statistics about how women are leaving jobs at very high rates. And one is the empowerment narrative that, that women are going to find better jobs. They're going to find more meaningful jobs, which is, you know, partially true. Um, and then there, are, but then there, there's a whole darker side to it that women can't get the right childcare arrangements. Arrangements. They're they're exhausted from outright racism. You know, they don't want to be paid anymore. And there's also the issue of they, sorry, they don't want to be underpaid anymore. Um, and there's also the issue of 
of burnout. Women are much more likely to say that they suffer from burnout than men. So this all raises this interesting question of who has the power in this moment? Is it the worker in a tight labor market? Is it the companies who still control what work culture looks like? Is it the government that has the ability to put policies in place that make it easier for working women to get paid well and have access to, say, childcare? So I know that's a big topic. Um, maybe I'll start on the ground level. Lisa, how have you seen the Great Resignation play out among your female employees in the last 18 months or so? First, let me say, I think it's all of the above. Um, I think we create a, a false narrative and we create this uncomfortable and unhealthy competition. We know from, you know, Edelman does this, this trust barometer every year where we look at uh, what is the level of trust um, in, um, in our institutions, in, in government, in media, in nonprofits, um, and in business. And we do well when all four of those entities work together to address, Elizabeth, the issues that you just talked about. Um, this concept of the belief-driven employee, we did some research on this back in August, and some of the findings um, terrified people because it was an explanation of the great resignation. But again, I saw it as an opportunity, although I want to be clear, I, I am challenged by it every day. It's not as easy as I'm making it sound because it is something that we have to navigate. But one, for me, it was a stunning six and 10 percent of uh, respondents says that they choose their employer based on the beliefs of that company. Um, and including refusal to work at a company because of their disagreement on social issues. Um, the pandemic, and I think, um, uh, Abby, you talked about this, the pandemic has prompted people to reconsider work writ large. Um, and one in five respondents, this is the great resignation, told us that they have either left their jobs or they're planning to do so within the next six months. And that number is 41% in the U.S. So either have left or are planning to. And the rationale is I want to go someplace where there's a better values fit for me. Um, I want better compensation. I don't see my career advancement or my employer is not doing enough to address employee burnout. And the numbers for women were exponentially higher in this space. Um, and then, um, and we're all feeling this and workplace activism has become the new norm or 76%, that is a huge number, 76% of employees say that they are willing to take whatever action is necessary uh, to produce urgent change within their company. So it's a completely different type of employer. And I think the smart organization welcomes these folks, gives them space to opine, to breathe, uh, and to make the work better as a result. Yeah. And you mentioned um, in par as part of the belief driven employee, there is an interesting way that women are not using wages as their number one reason to stay with a company. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's flexibility is am I seen? Um, do I understand what my career advancement is? It's all of these things. But I'm very, very cognizant of iGen's point of view because it, it almost feels like there's a level of elitism in this conversation. And there's a level of elitism in everything that we're doing. And I myself got caught in it when um, I posted, I was asked to comment with a number of CEOs about um, this new workplace and the challenges of going back to the office. And my brother, whom I love, called and said, I saw what you said, it was lovely, but what about people like me who never had that option? What about people like you all are, he said, and I don't know if you all can even hear yourselves, you're debating about how to go back to the office. I never got a chance to leave. And what about us? And so I think we have to be really careful with, with this elitism that, you know, the have, the have issues as opposed to the have not issues. Yeah. Aijen, how do you think that we can give care workers, this is a ginormous question, how can we give care workers, domestic workers, the same kind of freedom to be able to choose how they want to work? Well, I think it starts with making care jobs good jobs that are family sustaining jobs with good wages, living wages, access to benefits and economic security, paid sick days, and time off to be able to spend with your family. and 
you know, I think we are in a historic moment right now because all of us um, in this pandemic have faced some form of a care crisis, whether it's because our kids were home or our parents were on lockdown in a nursing home or we were thousands of miles away from somebody we needed to care for. And, um, and I think what it really gave us is an opportunity to invest in care, child care, paid family and medical leave, home and community-based care for older people and people with disabilities. These are three core pillars of what's in President Biden's Build Back Better agenda. And I just wanna say how essential a piece of the puzzle I think that is, because we saw in the pandemic, at least 4 million women get pushed out of the workforce because of caregiving challenges. And if you're a home care worker, for example, and, you're, and your salary is about $18,000 per year, but the average cost of childcare is about $9,000 per year, you might decide that it's better for you to stay home and take care of your kid as opposed to go and work even though you believe that elder care is your calling. And so I think just yeah. to, it's about putting the infrastructure in place and the resources in place to make these jobs good jobs where women have the agency to make real choices, not impossible choices, real choices about their futures and their families' well-being. How do you feel about what has made it into the spending plan? I was just, I mean, it's changing so much, but it looks like universal pre-K and child care, as well as 150 million, I believe, for home care um, have made it in. And I know paid leave is still the sort of elephant in the room and we're, we, we're definitely gonna talk about that. But what do you, what do you think of the, the status quo right now? I think that what's in the agenda is transformative. And I just wanna say, I'm speaking it into the universe, paid family and medical leave is in the Build Back Better Act in the house and we are gonna make it real. It is our future. Um, and the child care pre-K, child tax credit, paid family medical leave and home care pieces, these are investments in care across the lifespan that will enable millions of working family caregivers to work, parents to work. I mean, it is a game changer. And is it everything we need? No, it's a, but it is a transformative generational advance in terms of putting the kind of 21st century care systems in place that we need. So we'll, we, if we can get, when we get this done, it will be a new day and a whole new reset on our economy. I'm, I'm, um, it's interesting to hear you so optimistic. Abby, I want to turn this to you because you've been making the center right case. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, maybe I am. Um, Abby, you, you've been making the center right case for paid family leave for, for quite a while. And, um, when Joe Manchin mentioned his opposition to keeping paid family leave in the spending bill, he said, we can't go too far left. This is not a center left or left country. Um, if anything, we're a center right country. But according to a morning console poll, 62% of Republican women and 56% of Republican men actually want paid leave to remain in Joe Biden's reconciliation bill. What does Joe Manchin not understand about paid family leave right now? Well, uh, you know, we are in a, this is not the optimistic part, I'll end with that, but we are in an incredibly polarized political environment. And even, you know, when policies are good, there's political dynamics around them. So as an example, President Trump proposed six weeks of paid parental leave when he was president. Not many people on the other side of the aisle jumped on that. And you're not seeing many people on the right side of the aisle or the center left, which I'd put Senator Manchin in, jumping on the current provisions either despite the fact that the vast majority of republicans democrats and independents want this to get done so at some level there is some amount of washington dysfunction that defies reason for why so far this hasn't gotten through because the evidence for paid leave and specifically here around paid parental leave which is where we have the vast majority of evidence internationally and also domestically um, the most generous policies are specifically for new parents in companies in countries and specifically for mothers, although I think it should be gender neutral, but we know that there are significant economic and uh, health impacts of having this policy. To me, it seems like a no brainer. And certainly if you, depending on how you define the scope of the paid leave provisions, which I think has been some of the issue, 
with what's included in EBB, it doesn't have to be tremendously expensive either. And I think, you know, Senator Manchin has rested a lot of his concerns on the top line cost of the bill. And you can do paid parental leave and paid family leave in a way that's incredibly affordable and um, still really changing the option set available to working parents in particular. So I am hopeful that, you know, despite Washington seeming broken, although I guess we did pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill, that this is something that's not going away and that we will reach uh, some type of transformative change soon. Yeah. Um, when you think about the Republican Party and I mean, I, I know you talked a lot about polarization and the sort of moment we're in makes certain policies seem that might seem common sense, seem untenable. What do you think right. the Republican Party can do better when it comes to um, policies that put family first? Yeah. Well, first, I just want to say, you know, when I started working on these issues 10 years ago, it was kitschy for a millennial woman to be working on them. It was not as serious as financial reg or these other issues. It was very kind of to the side. And I think that has changed over the years. And you have Senator Romney and Lee and Senator Rubio and Ernst and, you know, the Trump administration has said putting forward um, family policies on whether it's the child families or paid leave uh, or child care. I think to me, I would I would encourage both sides perhaps to go bolder. And in particular on the Republican side, a lot of it has been rearranging existing benefits that go to family, which is a shrinking mm -hmm. share of our federal. One out of every six dollars goes to kids relative to uh, Americans over the age of 65. And that's only going to shrink here as we move forward with the boomers. Um, increasingly crossing that threshold. And so I think to some extent, there has to be a, a more radical reshifting of how we spend our money and rebalancing of the generational inequities we're seeing. And so I'd like to see Republicans, instead of kind of rearranging this, this smaller and smaller share to kind of go broader and think about how can we, how can we do a better job investing in families and in early childhood education more broadly. Yeah, I know we have one, one more minute and Lisa, I'm wondering if you could answer quite briefly for us, where CEOs and businesses are on the paid leave question. I know there used to be daylight between um, CEOs and Democrats on this issue, and now they're sort of coming back around to supporting national paid family leave. Do you talk about it, in your CEO clubs? You know, I want to I want to say we do um, and we don't. Um, I talk about it. It's important to me. And um, I think it's something that uh, I, Jen, said earlier that really stayed with me. Until we place appropriate value on our families, until we place appropriate value on the raising of our children and looking at them as the future of our nation um, and those that care for them, and unless we, until we place appropriate value on the things that really matter, um, I don't know that we will see the type of transformative change that both iGen and Abby have, have referenced, but um, I think it is incumbent upon the business community. And like most things, um, we need these folks in the workplace and I think when women and others are um, abundantly clear and loud about their needs that um, other CEOs like myself will be forced to, to listen and to react and to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you to Abby, Aijen, and Lisa for joining us for this conversation. I am amazed by the optimism. I shouldn't say amazed. I'm heartened by the optimism that I saw on this panel. I think it's uh, great to think of this as a an opportunity to reinvent, an opportunity to re rebuild, and really an opportunity that it's not an option to miss. Um, so with that note, I'm going to say goodbye to our panelists and turn it over now to Anita Kumar, Politico's first ever senior editor for Standards and Ethics and a former White House correspondent at Politico. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Thank you.